Hello, my friends. Welcome to me, your host, Christian Watson. So, my friends, someone turned me on to this fellow YouTuber, this um, gay YouTuber called Jacob Michael, and his sexual orientation is important for a reason that I will get to in just a few seconds. And uh, they told me that this guy made a, vic a video about, uh, about how he believes that homosexuals, gay people, are still victims in the United States and are still being victimized by certain ideas. Now, you know, when I first heard this, I figured that this would just be a rant video or something of that sort. Then I actually watched the video, and I actually got to see some of his arguments. And he was actually making this his, his claims in response to a Reddit thread um, that was basically a grievance complaint from someone who identifies as gay as well, who wanted to criticize the gay community for in part, being so activist-like in their rhetoric, and also in part, being pretending to be or acting as if they are victims due to a lot of things in the world. And so, of course, Jacob made advanced several arguments against this proposition that I find wholly troublesome. So I decided that I would make a video responding to Mr. Michael's contentions uh, on this issue. Uh, now, I will have the Reddit thread in the link down below, so you'll be able to see the thread. I will also have Mr. Michael's video in the link down below, so you'll be able to see his response as well. But there's a point in the video where he discusses the Reddit thread in terms of how it characterized um, gay people's ability to be comfortable with who they are in modern day society. Here's what he says. And so, yeah, whenever I hear people talking about how, you know, being gay is not really a big deal to them. I mean, I would agree. I feel the same way about myself, but that's only because I'm privileged enough to be able to feel that way about myself. Like the fact that I don't have to worry about it or think about it, that's more of a privilege than it is a virtue. I mean, at least that's my opinion. Now, of course, this is troublesome because Mr. Michaels here is posing the idea that the comfortability of self is a matter of privilege. Essentially, the only reason that one can be comfortable with being gay, according to Mr. Michael, is because they are privileged. This attaches a social condition to a ontological reality. All ontological means, it means that it is a part of your being. It is a part of who you are. And you, my friend, contrary to what Aristotle would say, we are not creatures molded and created by society. We are creatures that are molded and created in a sort of sense that is a part of society, then we enter into society for various reasons, even if that entry into society is not necessarily formal or it's not necessarily something we remember, we enter into society for a very particular purpose. So you, he's conflating our being as human beings with society when those are two distinct things that have interrelation most certainly, but they're not necessarily inseparable. That's number one. Number two, he essentializes the gay individual as a product of their own environment. My friends, there is something much more to your development as a human being, to your um, physiology, your, com your, your composition as a human being, than merely your um, environment. In fact, you exist most of the time, this is the story of humanity, in spite of your environment. Think about this. Humans have existed for so, so, so long in spite of natural disasters, in spite of um, people that wanted to kill them, whether it was in the settlers or whether it was with other countries that were going to war, in spite of debilitating diseases, smallpox, chickenpox that wiped a lot of people out, we exist in spite of our environments, my friends, because we are endowed with a divine brilliance, a rational brilliance by which we can exercise our faculties productively, fruitfully, and creatively to live in this world. You cannot tell me that someone indeed who may be homosexual and may be in an environment that is antithetical to that cannot simply see themselves in other lights and present themselves in other lights than they're simply being gay. Mr. Michaels claims that if you are not privileged, that you are bound to thinking about this part of your identity. But that's not, that's not the case, though. You're not bound to anything. You don't have to think about it. All you have to do is simply represent the wholeness of yourself and act in a way that would perhaps get you to an environment that is more comfortable. I'm not excusing homophobia. Trust me. I, I'm not excusing that at all. I think homophobia is a wrong. It's wrong. It's not right. But I am 
criticizing the idea that you have to be A, a product of your environment, or B, a product of a single part of yourself, i.e. your orientation, or C, that you have to use either of those things and use social status to escape them. No, you have the ability to unlock greatness, to unlock freedom within you. In fact, you're already a naturally free individual in spite of social circumstances. Emerson says that he who can exist uh, in, in perfect solitude against society that's the great one. Michael is not extolling a virtue, a, a mentality of greatness here. Michael is not extolling that whatsoever. He's extolling a sort of perpetual victimhood that binds who you are to social structures, and that is wrong. He also says, now I'll give him some credit, he says that an over-reliance on a victimhood is counterproductive or can be counterproductive to self-progression. And then he also missed that the victim card can be weaponized. But after saying that, he says this. I do agree that like self-victimization can be taken to like an unhealthy extreme. But also, at least in my opinion, you know, there are enough people out there who actually are victims that I don't think we should be jumping to the conclusion that everybody who claims to be a victim is doing so in a malicious way or as a way to sort of get attention and to shirk responsibility for themselves. Now, my friends, the argument here is that people who think they are victims are not using their victimhood maliciously. So, my friends, there is a distinction, a clean distinction, between intention and action. Although they go hand in hand in many instances, i.e., if someone wants to go hunt something, that's the intention. Them taking the rifle to shoot the deer that they're hunting, that's the action. There is not always, however, a causal relationship between intention and action. In this instance, someone can logically believe they are a victim and use that fact in a malicious way without realizing or even believing that they're acting maliciously. In fact, I think that it is more likely that they won't even believe they're acting maliciously because of their paradigm. Obviously, Mr. Michaels here would not believe that they're acting maliciously because apparently there are things that are actually happening in their lives that would give them the ability to say that they are victims. So again, I, 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 I just don't like the idea that we're going to just allow people to think certain things and use intention as a barrier of critiquing them, when in all reality, intention does not necessarily imply action, and action should be the ones that are analyzed. Guess what? Intentions are spiritual. I can't necessarily detect or discern those from the naked eye, but I can detect and discern actions empirically. So that is what... For me, an impartial observer, that is what is best for me to try to understand someone's status, someone's disposition. Unless they express their intentions to me, I can't detect them. Only through their actions can I even get a glimpse of what that person is. Then he says this bit about here about the complexity of victimhood. person who wrote this post, they themselves described their early experiences with conversion therapy. I mean, the only reason they went through that was because they were the victim of some sort of homophobia. I mean, I don't know if they made themselves go to conversion therapy or if they were pressured by friends and family. Whatever the case may be, they went because there was some degree of homophobia that was leading them to feel like they needed to change this part of who they were. So my friends, they have to be very careful about how we phrase things. So there are a mul there are multiple multiple externalities that establish victimhood or not in this instance. If someone at their own urging, not at the urging of a community or a family, undertook conversion therapy, they hurt themselves. They victimized themselves. This should be understood as self-victimhood. But if someone was pressured or coaxed into going to conversion therapy by other people, they were indeed victimized. But there is a big difference between being a victim and being victimized. The former is a personal choice. The former is not merely a status that someone inflicts upon you and it stays there. No, no, no. That's a deterministic idea of victimhood. No, no, no. The former is a mindset that translates into action. Remember that causal relationship between action and intention? Uh, that, that exists in the term of the victim. Whereas the latter is an uncontrollable action that someone else inflicted upon you. So yes, 
We can be victimized, but we don't have to remain in that moment of victimization because victimization occur occurs in a temporal moment. All moments in society, all moments in the world, excuse me, chronologically are temporal. They exist, they fleet, they go away, they happen and they go away. Yes, wounds can stay, wounds can linger, but you have the authority the conceptual authority of, of if you're going to let those wounds define who you are and shape who you are, or if you're going to resist those wounds, understand that they happen to you, but they are not you. The greatest, greatest, greatest people who ever got free, who ever, excuse me, asserted their freedom were those who understood that independent of their circumstances, they were still great people. Independent of their circumstances, they were still victors, not victims. I'm preaching someone right now, man. These people, the, the, the slaves in the American South, they didn't let their circumstances hold them down. They sang spirituals. There's 12 gates to the city. Keep your eyes on the prize. Don't stay in the wilderness too long. We're, when we amesh ourselves to a victim mentality, we are bucking ourselves down into the conceptual wilderness of darkness. But those spirituals liberated the minds and then therefore shed that victimhood. The victimization was still transpiring, but the conceptual freedom allowed them to translate that idea of freedom into action, which freed them from the slaves of their captors. You could not have the Underground Railroad. You could not have Frederick Douglass without having that conceptual freedom born from those spirituals. You couldn't have it. You couldn't have it. There's a causal relationship between intention and action sometimes. And in this instance, it absolutely is there. You can be victimized, but not a victim. Let's keep going on, my friends. So he then goes on to say about this as it respects to trans people being victims with respect to laws. Go on. And this is just a single issue that tends to affect gay men and gay women the most. I mean, there are tons of other legal actions that are taking place right now in state governments that are actively oppressing trans people. For example, less than a week ago from the time of filming this, Arkansas passed a law that bans trans youth from accessing gender-affirming therapy. In addition to this, there are three states which have recently banned trans people from participating in sports. And trans people are very much victims with respect to these laws. So a few problems here. Okay, number one, he fails to explain how stopping a child who, of, who questions of agency and consent for children are far from established. We tend to think that kids don't really have that ability for various philosophical reasons. From undergoing a physiologically altering practice victimizes them. In fact, logically, it cannot victimize them. A lack of a positive is not a negative. If I don't give you something, I'm not doing anything to you. I'm simply not interfering. If I don't give someone an apple, no matter how hungry you are, they are, I am not responsible if they die from, from starvation. Now, it probably is a nice thing for me to give someone an apple. And in fact, I myself have given money and food to homeless folks because I don't, I just, it's on my heart to do so. But conceptually, logically, I'm not killing them since their condition predates my action. The condition of a child remains the same, Jacob. The condition of a child remains the same if they are withheld from a certain thing. Their condition is not being impaired upon. I'm simply not granting them anything. And no one has an obligation to my interference. You also fail, Jacob, to specify the details of the laws in those states. You know, I think that the trans issue in terms of sports is very complex. And I do not believe the government should be involved in dictating the terms of sporting activities. That is not something that the government has the conceptual authority, or the, even my, my opinion, the ethical authority to commit. There is a distinction between ethical authority and legal authority. Many times the government operates in the realm of legal authority, which is presumed and sometimes artificially granted by state actors that has no ethical bearing. Prohibition is an example of this. Government has no ethical authority to prevent you or sh from putting alcohol in your body, but they presume to have the legal authority because they have this sort of amorphous conception of the common good, which has no relation to the individualist spirit of the American experiment, and they used that and enshrined it into law. Again, wrong, 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 ethically wrong, but they had the legal authority because they presumed it. So we have to be very careful here, my friends. We have to not take these issues for granted. It's obvious that Jacob is commentating 
from a very, very particular viewpoint. It's obvious. And he is presuming that viewpoint is 100% objective and universal without establishing that logically, a priori or otherwise. That's not a good way to do knowledge production, and that's not a good way to make a claim. And that's actually a pretty poor way of making a claim. Let's keep going on. So he then says that, you know, believing people to be victims uh, or believing the victim mentality to be ubiquitous can and cause others to ignore oppression that doesn't impact them and cause intolerance. Let's see here. This is kind of why I tend to get frustrated at people who get super frustrated at anybody who claims to be a victim in a situation because it not only encourages people to like ignore oppression that doesn't affect them, it actually encourages a certain level of like intolerance towards people who actually are victim. Okay, so again, the question of oppression is not settled. You frame this matter, Jacob, as if others recognize these things as oppressive and don't want to help. But you have a very ideologically centered idea of oppression that, regardless of how confidently you state it, is far from self-evident. You have not even proven this ubiquitous oppression. You have not proven that someone is oppressed because they cannot get a they cannot put the surgery that a child really can't consent to on their bodies. You have not proven that people are oppressed because there are certain things happening with sports. You've not proven that. You're simply stating things and hoping they stick. And I think that we should be intolerant, my friend, towards bad attitudes, as, as do you, because they rip us of the divine potential that all of us have to craft our lives and make our lives for ourselves. Now, he also makes a mention of the difference of opinions and how that can affect gay people. So let's look at this. Now, I have a feeling that if the United States began to criminalize being gay, I think a lot of us gay people would quickly stop viewing this as just a difference in opinion because it has a direct bearing on our way of life. And I mean, personally, I would like to stay optimistic about the fact that we have marriage equality now and we're slowly working towards trans liberation as well. And so I would like to think that in the future, we're only going to see an increase in progress. But I think it's important that we don't take the progress we've already made for granted, because there are people out there who would happily strip us of the rights that we recently acquired. So, okay, you have an emaciated view of rights, Jacob. You are, again, essentializing homosexuality as the basis of rights. This is what any talk of gay rights does. But this is not the case. Rights, my friends, are intrinsic to the human being, regardless of what social feature they may have. This is the basis of the state of nature theory that John Locke, who inherited this theory from natural law theorists like Hugo Grotius and Samuel von Pufendorf, among others, said the following in his second treatise of government. I quote, The state of nature has a law to govern it, which obliges everyone, and reason, which is the law that teaches all mankind who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty or possessions and when his own preservation comes not in competition ought he as much as he can to preserve the rest of mankind and may not unless it be to do justice or on an offender take away or impair the life or what tends to the preservation of life the liberty health limb and goods of others all that means is that as long as you are able to preserve yourself Make sure you can help other people, and there are things that other people cannot do to you. Those are rights, Jacob. I can look at them in, in, in a very stable context. They don't change depending on who is in social power. They don't change depending on who is being addressed. They don't change the basis of groups. These are individual rights that I can detect, understand, and I can sift out in a political system. Your idea of rights, group rights, is so amorphous, so ambiguous, that they can change at an instant, and the mechanisms that protect those rights necessarily have to change with them. And in my opinion, the ideology that group rights are born from, other than their inherent instability that I just mentioned, the ideology that they're born from is profoundly anti-liberty. The framework, the Lockean principle I just extolled, is the framework of the American experiment. This is a framework, a framework that is independent of identity and integral to individualism. What Jacob is describing is not rights nor is liberation. It is an ideology that would actually enable the systematic enforcement of certain opinions over others. Under natural law theory, free speech is implicated. Under identity theory, speech that harms people is not protected. See critical race theorist Mary Matsuda, who takes a, a ace out of Richard Delgado's book in her paper, The Public Response to Racist Speech, Considering the Victim's Story. She says the following. 
In calling for legal sanctions for racist speech, this article rejects an absolutist First Amendment position. It calls for the movement of societal response to racist speech from the private to the public realm. So basically, Matsuda proscribes a public response, a governmental response to speech that can be harmful to minorities in particular. This logic also extends over to gay folks as well, if their paradigm is still be accepted. But I just mentioned to you, again, that just because someone holds an opinion does not mean they have the authority to enact that opinion upon you. Your existence is not threatened by someone's opinion so long as they are not trying to enact that opinion upon you in a violent way. If they want to go and advocate for their opinion politically or whatever, good for them. But if you have the system, the framework of the American experiment, then guess what? They will not be able to get that opinion through to you. Now, I will admit, yes, in the past, with sodomy laws and obscenity laws, there have been subjective moral opinions enshrined upon our law and used to attack certain people. Yes. But that was because the American experiment's foundational principles were not being followed to a T. Here's my, here's my suggestion, Jacob. Let's not fight for gay rights. Let's seek to preserve individual rights. Because if you do that, then guess what? You won't have the power to enforce your opinions on anyone else, and they will not have the power to do the same to you in likeness. That's my opinion, Jacob, and I am sorely disappointed about how you're treating this issue. There are issues amongst gay individuals that need to be addressed, sorely. But guess what? I'm confident that if you were to review these things through a non, for, through a less narrow paradigm, I'm confident that you would find answers that would be suitable to you and let people who hold different views from you live themselves, live out their lives in peace and prosperity for themselves. This does not have to be a zero-sum game, Jacob. Gay folks are not victims. We are not victims unless we want to be. So, do we want to be victims? I don't want to be a victim. You don't want to be a victim. Okay, then stop it. Stop it. Victimization happens, but being a victim itself is a choice. Choose wisely. Think on it. As always, my friends, I love you, and please, if you could, support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash officialcwatson. But until then, my friends, I love you, and please stay pensive. Bye-bye.